Kirk Cousins collapses on Thursday Night Football. Are we still believers in the Redskins, or is it time to jump off that bandwagon? And is there reason to be worried about Calvin Johnson and his injured ankle? And also, what should you do about Jamal Charles and Niall Davis heading into Monday night's game against the Patriots? We've got our sleepers and busts for week four. We'll answer your questions and more here on today's episode of the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. My name is Nick, also known as Clickwood, and I am joined, as always, by my partner in crime, Dustin, or Project KSL. And Dustin, Kirk Cousins. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> he goes from epic glory to epic shit in one week. One week. Ah, uh, 427 yards and three touchdowns in week three. Comes out on Thursday Night Football here in week four and throws one of the worst games that we are probably ever going to see him have. Yeah. 257 yards, four picks, a fumble, only one touchdown. Dustin, what gives, man? I mean, are you still a believer in this guy? Is this New York Giants defense just that damn good? Or, or what's the deal? Uh, what happened? You know, the same reason I don't get too excited after one performance, I don't get too down after one performance. I mean, the Redskins just had a complete collapse on, all, like, on every level of that team. So I, I, I don't... My boy think... Alfred Morris still looked okay, though. Yeah, he got that one TD in the second half. It looked like he was a lost <laughs> cause until last. Uh, he caught so... a couple passes, too, for us PPR players. New career high. Yeah, he had, like, two. <laughs> I, I don't get too high. I don't get too down. But I, I think that I still like him going forward. I still think he's going to have his games where he is, does very well. I'm not dropping him immediately or anything like that. I it, It's something to be concerned with because he was staring down receivers, but I still trust their schedule. I trust the fact that he's going to not have a game like that again. Do you think it's kind of a case where he kind of got shell-shocked? Because that's what it looked like to me. Like, once he threw, like, that second pick, then it was just, like, all the wheels then came he off. Then freaking out. Yeah, I think it was a lot of just, man, he panicked so bad. Like I said, he was staring down receivers left and right. And, I mean, he didn't do that week one. And I mean, or not week one, excuse me. His first game against the Eagles. Week three. Right. And I don't think the Eagles are a good defense by any means. But yeah. the Giants aren't really that good of a defense by any means either. Right. So I think it's just one of those weeks he had. He had a horrible game. If he does it next week, too, then it's time to readdress. But for the time being, he had one good game, one bad game. with three is for his third start. Yeah, I, I pretty much agree with that. Um, If for whatever reason the person who owns Kirk Cousins in your league is freaking out right now, I think it might be a decent time to grab him. Um, Depending on what might you be able to give get, up. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you don't want to give up too much. But right. uh, I like like Dustin said, I don't expect it to get any worse from here. I think uh, it can only get better. I think that he is certainly – like I, I think he's somewhere in between where he was from week three to week four. I don't think he's a terrible uh, quarterback like, like we saw against the Giants. But I also don't think he's like the league's best quarterback like we saw in week three. So um, I think he's a viable starter going forward for fantasy purposes. Probably a borderline QB1 going forward. I, yeah. I have him probably somewhere between 10 to 12. 12 at quarterback so I mean you know don't get too excited about him but don't panic either if you have him right now don't be the guy who sells him at his absolute yeah, don't be low. dropping him don't be dropping him like immediately now yeah don't be I I, I pretty much agree the one thing that I am really concerned about with the Washington offense is Pierre Garçon is really really inconsistent so far this year I mean last year he led the league in receptions which I think if, if you hear that 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 might astonish a lot of people. It surprised me when I saw the stat at the end of the year. I was like, wait, what? Pierre Garçon led the league in receptions? But yeah, I mean, he he really did. And he's had a couple of games with double-digit catches this year. Week one and week three, double-digit catches. And then in weeks two and four, one catch, two catches. I mean, right. it's – and it's not a matter of just the quarterback situation either. These are with different quarterbacks. So – um, I, I worried a little bit about him, but the thing is, is man, he is, I, I saw that he was getting targeted so much in the first three games. And then week four, you, you said he was staring down his, uh, Kirk Cousins was staring down his receivers. Yeah. I don't remember a single time where he stared down Pierre Garçon though, which is a major concern to me that I'm a, since I'm a Pierre Garçon owner. Yeah. I think it's only one week. I, same re I'm not freaking out after that. Pierre Garçon has had big games as you're already like huge games. He was monstrous mm -hmm. last week. I think right. it might have just been the key to on Pierre Garcon, and I, I'm not concerned about him going forward. I think he's still going to be fine, still going to get a lot of targets, still going to get a lot of catches. 
So you still think he's a rock solid yeah, wide receiver yeah, I, too? Then? I have no concerns, no matter who the quarterback is for Pierre Garcon, just how he's using okay. that offense. Yeah, I, I mostly agree with that. Um, if it comes, if he comes out next week and has one, two catches, something like that, and he's only targeted four or five times, then I'm starting to get a little bit pissed yeah, off. Yeah, you, you can't just freak out after one week, like you said. Yeah, you got to you right. got to give it a couple weeks now, see what happens. But I think he'll be completely fine. So another big story that's happening right now that's, for whatever reason, it seems to be kind of going under the radar, and it's surprising to me because it's a big one. Uh, Calvin Johnson hasn't practiced fully at all this week. Right. And I know it's Calvin Johnson. It's Megatron. We don't really care if he practices so long as he's on the field. I get it to some extent. But when somebody misses Wednesday's practice, they miss Thursday's practice, and they're limited in the in the Friday, which is never really that big of a practice to begin with. Um I mean, he's listed as questionable, and the coaches are already talking about how they're a little bit worried about it. Dustin, are you worried about Kelvin Johnson and maybe not his ability to play? Because I think he's going to play on Sunday. But are you worried about that he's not going to be the Kelvin Johnson that we expect? No, because I think if it was something concerning, he wouldn't play. He wouldn't have practiced in any capacity. And I'll never forget, I think it was last year, maybe the year before that, going into the Jacksonville game, the Lions had, he didn't practice at all. He didn't yep. practice the entire week, and he had, I think he had a nagging, like a hamstring or a nagging ankle, something like similar. Didn't practice the whole week. You're like, man, he's questionable. I don't even know. He goes in there. He absolutely tears him the fuck up. <laughs> so, I, no, it's Calvin. I think they're just being cautious with him, as they probably should be. You know what you're going to get on Sunday? He's Calvin. I and, and not to mention he's playing the Jets this week. Nah, I, I'm playing him. I don't even. I mean, you, you have to obviously have to check and make sure he's not inactive. Mm-hmm. But it, barring he's playing, he's playing. I'm not even looking at it twice. Yeah, and, and that kind of brings up a, a bigger question, I guess, because this happens all the time in the NFL. We see our stud players, and they're in a situation where they haven't practiced all week, and um, it, it looks questionable that they might even play. And then we're sitting there going, okay, do I sit Do I sit my Calvin Johnson? In, or do, I, do I sit a guy like Calvin Johnson or another, like a stud running back, like a Jamal Charles or something like that for a mid-level guy like a Matt Asiata? You know, do I do, I do that in my flex spot yeah. or... You know, what do I do in those type of situations? Because for me, I I almost always am traditionally the kind of guy who is just like, I'm just going to play my studs, man. I I, I want my studs out there. I draft them to be my studs. And unless it's a situation where Matt Asiata is up against the Jaguars defense or something like that, um, he's just not going to break my lineup, man. It's not going to happen. Yeah, not working like Calvin or anything, sure. Right. I mean, are you pretty much in agreement with that, though? I mean, what what would need to happen for you to bench a guy like Calvin Johnson, you, you know, knowing that he probably is going to play on Sunday, but he might be a little bit I'd hamstrung? I mean, it, it would have to be a matchup like he's going against Seattle or something where it's just like, man, there probably is going to be very many points to go around. We're basically banking on him getting that big TD to have a, a sustainable fantasy day. I Right. It would probably be a matchup like that. Damn near any other defense, no matter if he's playing, I'm playing Calvin Johnson over just about anybody. Because it's Calvin Johnson. You just you just don't bench him. It just doesn't matter. I agree. I mean, he's just the kind of guy that you do that with. Um, I think most of your stud running backs you're going to do that with as well. Yeah. And also your quarterbacks. Now, uh, for your tight ends, I think it's a little bit of a different story. Now, obviously, Jimmy Graham's uh, an exception to the rule. Jimmy Graham, but... Julius Thomas, Rob Gronkowski are matchup proof. Anyone after that, right. I don't know. Right. Anybody after that, if you've got like a an Antonio Gates or something like that, and he's a little bit injured, I'm probably benching him uh, if it's a similar situation like this where he hasn't practiced all week, just because I don't really think that the high end potential is really there to begin with. So you kind of have to take into account all those type of things before you consider benching a guy on Sunday or on Monday, as the case might be. Yeah. But the last thing that I want to talk about before I get into some of the listener questions has to do with the Kansas City Chiefs and their running back situation. So we touched a little bit on it when I mentioned Jamal Charles, but he's listed as questionable again this week. Right. Now, I know you're a guy who actually owns both of these guys. Yep. But so imagine take yourself out of the situation where you didn't handcuff your stud as you should probably do as, as what you're seeing here but as take it take yourself out of those shoes and put yourself into the shoes of somebody who maybe isn't quite as savvy of a fantasy owner that decided that they were going to draft Jamal Charles first second third Not overall get didn't get Niall Davis and now they're sitting here looking at their roster and they're like okay I have to make a decision on Sunday do I play Jamal Charles or or do I play another guy who, you know, let's use an example again of a, a Matt Asiata level guy who probably isn't going to be the elite level guy, but, you know, decent we'll enough that he could start. Yeah. yeah. What do you do in that situation, Dustin? 
You know, generally, I guess it, it depends what you're hearing about, what the coach is saying about the player going into that week. Because, again, we said it, we play the studs. You know, and Jamal Charles obviously hasn't had, you know, as good of a start to a year as he would have liked or his owners would have liked at this point. But he's still Jamal Charles. We know what he is. He's an elite, he's an elite talented running back. There's very few running backs better than him. So you're, you're watching the injury report. You're seeing what the coach says. And Andy Reid says he expects Jamal Charles to play. He's going to be at home. They're going to want that game. I, I'm probably playing Charles over a guy like Asiata, definitely, depending just because, like I said, they think he's going to play. Andy Reid says he expects him to, so yeah, I, I'm definitely playing him for this week. So you're trusting your guy Andy Reid. Um, well, and- yeah. <laughs> Fuck Andy <laughs> Reid, but I mean, I don't think he'd lie about this, like, this sort of stuff. Yeah, I, I pretty much agree with that as well. Um, uh, in this case, I'm probably risking the zero. Um, and it yeah, might come out I mean, that you completely not regret it. Drop a forty on you or anything. I mean, that's the thing. So right, right. Um, now let's say it was a situation with a guy who maybe is a little bit more stable. Um, let's say that it's like a a Joik Bell level player, right. somebody who we we have a little bit more faith in. Maybe um, are we sitting a guy like Jamal Charles just because he might get us a zero? Or, I mean, here's the other situation, too. Do you ever come into a game and say, I know this is going to sound really disgusting, but let's say right now Joel McKnight's available. Okay. Yeah, Joel McKnight tore his Achilles earlier, so, I mean. Okay, you know, but whoever the, whoever the yeah, whoever the yeah. third stringer, I'm just using him as an example, but, right. you know, a, a guy who is down the depth chart, I've seen this happen before, where somebody will take that risk on their, their stud player, and they'll go up and pick up the backup guy or the just third case, string guy if sure. he's if he's not or if he's currently available just because he might get a couple of touches yeah i mean do you do you ever do something like that if you're in that situation i mean maybe it's it's all about circumstance and if your bench is just that bad but i mean yeah certainly if you're really banking on jamal charles and then randomly you know monday because he plays on a monday today or this week if it comes out that you know jamal charles isn't playing and it's like well i'm either getting a zero or i'm gonna pick up donnie avery or someone like that to play in the flex this week i mean obviously you go out and you pick him up and you throw him in there rather than get a zero from charles Right, but if Charles is playing, nah, you don't even worry about it. You put, you you keep playing Jamal Charles. You don't even stress about it. Yeah, that's a good point too. I think the flex uh, situation gives you a lot more flexibility. Yeah, <laughs> like you mentioned, if you take Jamal Charles and you put him in your flex, and you take another guy and move, bump him up to your RB two, that gives you the opportunity to play a wide receiver, whether it be on the Kansas City side or on the New England side. Which we don't really love any of the receivers other than um, than our guy Julian Edelman in that whole game. Right, yeah. I mean, we're we're in agreement on that, right? I mean, you still, you, I mean, you definitely start Gronk. You definitely start Julian. I'm Edelman. talking about wide receivers, though, specifically. Oh yeah, Julian Edelman's the only wide receiver. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's the only run, the guy that we like really. But you know, I think picking up a guy like a, I was like gonna a sound Donnie so Avery or something. Yeah, or Donnie or Avery or yeah. like a Travis Kelsey if he's maybe in there. You throw him. In, yeah, you if, him in the flex. if you can, yeah, if you can do a tight end at your flex position. I know a lot of leagues you can, some leagues you can't. Uh, think about that as well because those are always an opportunity. But uh, I think for the most part, like the the general theme here is that we're generally going to take the chance on our guy, even but if be- he gives us a zero. Beyond that, though, that's why you handcuff your guys because I have Nile Davis right. and I have Jamal Charles, and no matter what, I'll have one of them play on one Monday. Right, and and, and I think out, so. And I think that brings up a a big point, too, because so far we've seen with the top, each of the top three running backs this year, we've seen uh, LaShawn McCoy, we've seen his backup, Darren Sproles, put up decent numbers. And obviously, we've talked about this, Darren Sproles, (laughs) right, he has a little bit of a different role. But um, if, you know, if LaShawn McCoy were to go down, I think Darren Sproles obviously becomes a little bit more valuable. Now, uh, Adrian Peterson, obviously, with his situation, you see Matt Asiata become available. Uh, and you have to go out there and get him. But if you were the guy that handcuffed your stud, you didn't have to waste a waiver wire claim on yeah, it. Yeah, and and instead of drafting some guy deep down in your draft, some garbage player that's never going to make your lineup, sometimes it's good to just handcuff your stud at the end of the draft. There's nothing wrong with it. No, nothing so, at all. So I like to see that. I like to see guys like Niall Davis owned by the guy who gets Jamal Charles because it's just it's a smart thing to do if you can do it. Don't overdraft them. Don't draft Jamal Charles in the in the first and then draft Niall Davis in the sixth. Yeah. Don't be that dumbass. But get him in your fourteenth round when he's still available. I mean, there's really no reason not to. Yeah. Don't so, be taking shots on randos like D'Angelo Williams and a guy like Niall Davis or something right. like that. Exactly. I've seen like guys like Mike Tolbert get drafted at yeah. the end of drafts, and it's like, dude, you're never gonna put him in your lineup ever. 
Yeah. If exactly. you're ever in that situation, you're so screwed that you yeah, might as well just quit fantasy bucket. football. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. So let's get into the questions that we have this week. And thank you guys for sending them in. We've got probably more this week than we ever had before. I had to chop them down quite a bit. So I do appreciate all the support you guys are giving us. If you do have questions for next week's games, if you want any trade advice or anything like that, make sure that you leave them in the comment section below or tweet them to us at click with TV or at project KSL. We won't have another podcast out before this weekend's game. So if you are leaving a comment below, you might see me respond to it uh, just with the comments. Obviously we won't have it in the next uh, audio video program, but with that being said, let's get into the the questions from you guys. So the first one comes from at Beakboy333 on Twitter, and he has a standard scoring league trade question. So what's happening in his trade is that he would be giving up Darren Sproles, Brandon Marshall, or excuse me, he would be receiving Darren Sproles, Brandon Marshall, and T.Y. Hilton. He would be giving up Le'Veon Bell, Marcus Wheaton, and Terrence West. So I think a pretty a fair trade, trade here. Uh, standard scoring does make things a little bit different. If oh, yeah. this was PPR, it changes it. Yeah. yeah if, if this is PPR, I think both of us are jumping on this and getting the Darren Sproles, Brandon Marshall, T.Y. Hilton end of things. But because right. it's not, it is a little bit closer. What do you think about this trade, Dustin? Do you do you think he should sit pat, or do you think that he should make the move to get this uh, this elite yeah. wide receiver and a, a good running back in Darren Sproles? You know, it, I, Le'Veon Bell is the best player in the trade, and there's mm-hmm. a lot of time to put a priority. There's a lot of lot to be said for just getting the best player in the trade. Very true. Le'Veon Bell is the best player in this trade without any doubt. I really like Brandon Marshall. I don't like him nearly as much in non PPR. Same with Darren Sproles. I think those guys are two PPR studs, two pretty good players in non PPR still though. Brandon Marshall's still wide receiver one in standard. Oh, yeah, scoring. certainly. But he's very, very Brandon good. Marshall wide receiver one in PPR, though. Is, you know what I mean? He's not that mm-hmm. big of an advantage week to week. Right. He's just not. So Agreed. I, I, I like Marcus Wheaton more than a lot of other people, I, and I'm totally comfortable with that. Not saying he's going to be a crazy wide receiver, but him and T.Y. Hill have been very comfortable this year. Yep. And at least Marcus Wheaton. Almost given, equal stats. Yeah, I mean, Marcus Wheaton's at least had a few rushing attempts, too, on in rounds and stuff. So, I mean, that's kind of going for him. Those almost cancel out, so... Then you go down to, I mean, Le'Veon Bell is better than Brandon Marshall, Marcus Wheaton, I think T.Y. Hilton, or Wash. So then it comes down to Darren Sproles or Terrence West. I mean, and obviously you take Darren Sproles because Isaiah Crowell is even getting more touches there too and Ben Tate's coming back. So Terrence West is sort of a write-off. It's just how much do you value Le'Veon Bell? If you think Le'Veon Bell finishes the top three running back, you probably don't do that trade. But and I think, think it, it depends on your roster as well. Yeah, your I roster mean, makeup here makes a big difference yeah. because if you have another stud running back, I think that you can make this trade a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, the the It's probably pretty unlikely that you have Le'Veon Bell and another stud running back, but if you were at the end of your first round and you ended up with, let's say, DeMarco Murray and Le'Veon Bell as your first two picks... Yeah, you could do it then. I think you could do it. I think you could make the trade for a Marshall because that probably means that you're a little bit struggling at wide receiver, which is probably why you're considering making this trade. Right. So, again, depends on your roster makeup here, but I think that overall, in in a bubble where we don't really think about the external elements, I'm making this trade personally... Um, I don't think it's a slam dunk for you or anything, but I think I'm I'm pulling the trigger on it. It's real even. I mean, it, it all comes down to what else you have if you have another good running back. But if you're in a situation where it's like, well, I have Le'Veon Bell and my running back too is like Doug Martin, then nah, I'm hanging on to I'm hanging on to Le'Veon Bell and seeing what happens. But I, right. I, like you said, it, if if you have something else on your roster that's going to be a week to week good fantasy running back, yeah, you probably make the deal. Yep. All right, so let's move on to our next question, and this comes from Houdat360, at Houdat360 on Twitter, and he wants to know, same question as we got last week from a different user, um, and this one has to do with the two wide receivers, the two rookie wide receivers, Kelvin Benjamin at Baltimore or Brandon Cooks at Dallas. Now, last week, both of us said Kelvin Benjamin. Both of these guys had a good game. Kelvin Benjamin did outscore Brandon Cooks in all formats, so we we were happy about that. We both chose Kelvin Benjamin last week, yep. but this week... I'm taking a little bit of a different stance. I'm going with Brandon Cooks against Dallas, man. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, he's playing Dallas. That's all you really need to say. (laughs) He he, he just played Dallas' trash defense. I think Kelvin (laughs) Benjamin has to play. He plays Baltimore this week, who actually has two pretty good corners on Darius Webb and Jimmy Smith, which you assume one of them will be there. But beyond that, the bigger issue in that game is the fact that Carolina's offensive line just looks all-time bad. Baltimore has Haloti Nada. They have Chris Canty. They have Alvis Jumerville. They have Terrell Suggs. They're going to be getting after Cam Newton. So it's going to be hard to see him really have enough time to hit Calvin Benjamin on those deep throws. I definitely think it's Brandon Cooks without question this week. 
Yeah, I think so too. Um, yeah, I, I think we like both of these guys on a week to week basis. Yeah, I don't uh, think we you're prob- in a terrible shot if you if you're having to start Kelvin Benjamin, but between the two, yeah. it's it's Brandon Cooks. Yep, agreed. All right, so next question comes from at two thousand and one underscore. And he wants to know, do I start Doug Martin at Pittsburgh or Matt Asiata versus Atlanta? Unfortunately, we don't know if this is PPR or not. I don't right. know if that make makes sure a big difference. but yeah, got to make sure you guys say that in the comments if you ask. Yeah, it, it is important because uh, the first person, when they when they said that it was a standard scoring trade with that question, that did make a big difference. Oh, because yeah, he, like we said, PPR, if it's PPR, yeah. yes. So Doug Martin or Matt Asiata this week just in a bubble. Let's, let's assume it's standard scoring if right. they didn't mention. Um, I, I'm going Asiata. He gets Atlanta this week. I really like that matchup for him. Atlanta's defense is absolutely putrid. Teddy Bridgewater, they're going to have some type of game plan based around him. I I think that um, Doug, I mean, we don't know how healthy Doug Martin really is. He gets Pittsburgh this week. That's a hard matchup for him. Mm-hmm. Not, not so much just because Pittsburgh's been a great defense this year, but he's still, you assume he's going to be splitting some time with Bobby Rainey because we don't know how, right. whole, how healed he really is. And Asiata looks like he pretty firmly has that role. I'm I'm going to Matt Asiata without pretty much without really any much debate this time. I agree, and I I think a lot of people are going to have Doug Martin ranked ahead of Matt Asiata this week. But to me, we have to see what they're going to do in Tampa Bay with the running back situation because yeah. Doug Martin's already shown he can't stay healthy. So I mean, are they going to give him a full complement of carries at all ever this entire year? Yeah. If they exactly. don't. If, if he only touches the ball 10 to 15 times a game, I don't see how he can be a week-to-week starter nope. for fantasy. Not in this offense. I say not I mean, Tampa. If, yeah. if, if it's Philadelphia, maybe. But we're sitting here talking about Tampa Bay, which just hasn't been able to move They're the football. They're one of the three football. worst teams in the league right now. Yeah, it's your timeshare running back and on a team like that. It's just, nah, you want nothing to do with it. And you know it's a bad situation when we're looking at Minnesota's offense and we're going, yeah, they're probably a little bit in Tampa Bay. Oh, yeah, like, definitely better than Tampa's <laughs> right now, yeah. I mean, that's bad because, I mean, Matt Minnesota's going with a rookie quarterback and a running back who is backing up Adrian Peterson. Like, yeah. they don't, it's not like they have a bunch of studs. Yeah, but exactly. it's And Kyle Rudolph's gone for the season. The so, matchup is good, though. I mean, Atlanta's defense has been terrible. At least they, they have, have going for Except them, for yeah. when they play Tampa Bay. <laughs> yeah, so, and they tore up Tampa Bay. But. Right, so I, I think we're both going with Matt Asiata here, but uh, think about it. Make sure you pay attention to what happens with Doug Martin. Don't just pay attention to just the carries. Pay attention to the snaps as well if you can. Yeah. Uh, there are websites out there. I think it's – I want to say it's Football Outsiders. Yeah. I they think that they counts. keep track of – yeah, I think they keep track of snap counts. So go ahead and check that out at the end of this week. See where Doug Martin stands, and uh, then you make your decision for the future based off of what you see there. So next question comes from Corbin Johnson on YouTube, and he wants to know – what should I do with Vincent Jackson? Should I try to trade him or should I try to hold on to him? Oh, man. And, man, this one I think is really, really tough because... Yeah, he's been such a disappointment. <sighs> yeah, and it's, again, Tampa but Bay's offense. I, They've I, been so brutal. The one thing I'll say about Vincent Jackson is, is the Glenn was his quarterback last year. And yep. the Glenn at least understood, just throw it up. Yep. Just throw it to Vincent the ball. Jackson, go down, and, and see what happens with it. And he was totally comfortable doing it. So I assume Vincent Jackson's value or just production will get better. I do because I think the Glenn and or my the Glenn, the Glenn is just a better fit for <laughs> the Glenn Vincent Jackson. Yeah, he's just our a guy. Fit. The Glenn, the Glenn. Yeah, he just he's gonna throw it up. So I really do think that Vincent Jackson is gonna have a week soon where it's like, oh man, you know, he got two TDs and 80 yards this week, looking pretty good. And I think at that point, you hang on to him until he has that game, and yeah. then when he has that game, you get someone to be like, oh man, Vincent Jackson's back, and you try and sell him high. But I'm really not too comfortable keeping him for the rest of the year because I just think Tampa Bay is putrid. I think that could be this week for the very reason be. that yeah. you mentioned it. Um, I think Glennon is definitely, at this point, sh- he's shown that he has chemistry with Vincent Jackson. Yeah, and I know people had this weird thing where they thought that Josh McCown was going to be some rock star QB, and it just it hasn't happened. So yeah. um, it, it'll be interesting to see what they do here this week. Uh, I don't expect that Mike Glennon is going to somehow go out here and just start you know, targeting other receivers. I don't think Mike Evans is going to take over as the number one wide receiver oh, down there. No, so no I like Vincent Jackson this week. Pittsburgh's defense, they've been okay, but they're not spectacular. Lost Ike Taylor too. Yep. Yeah, it's a good point. So Vincent Jackson does have a decent matchup this week. I want to see what he does this week. I, I think you have to hold on to him right now because if you sell him, you are selling him pretty much at the lowest possible value that he is going yeah. to have. 
So I don't like it. I never like trading guys when they're coming off of three straight bad games. It just, it, you're not going to get what you should for them unless you're in a situation where you just, you look at it and you're like, I don't see this getting better. I, yeah. I don't, but I don't see any situation where it doesn't get this better like unless he gets better hurt. for Vincent Jackson. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of how I feel about guys like that. So let's talk about another player who we're thinking about uh, buy low, sell high on. This oh, is yeah, one that you wanted Twitter, to bring up. I forgot about that. Yeah. Earlier today, I saw on Twitter too, I saw a question being asked. It was right now, should you be buying or selling Monty Ball too in fantasy leagues? And mm-hmm. I thought it was a really good question. It really made me think like, I, I you know, I'm kind of conflicted where I am on this because of how bad his numbers were good the first two weeks, but last week they were terrible. That's Seattle. Mo- very few running backs are enough, even moderately good days for Seattle. But just yeah. the eye test, he's failing miserably. He looks god awful. So it, it really made me wonder, where do you think he is on that right now? Well, you know, Monty Ball is a guy that I hitch my wagon to coming into this season. And so far, I'm just like banging my head on a wall because you're right. He's not passing the eye test at yeah, all. He looks terrible. like a piece of shit. Yeah. Um, the thing is, Denver's offense as a whole has actually been a little bit down from what they were last year. They've had a, 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 t- a tough matchup against Seattle. Getting so back think is going to be big for them going forward, too. Right, and, and that's the thing is I think Denver's offense gets better from here, okay? It will, and, without and a doubt. Even if, even if we're just talking about the passing aspect of their game and if Monty Ball keeps up with his meh yards per carry, um, yeah. it, it to me, I don't think it particularly changes his value that much. The reason that I was buying Monty Ball is never because I thought he was going to come out there and rush for 1,500 yards and situation. he was some stud. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's you look at it and he, the guy has realistic possibility of scoring 12 touchdowns this oh, year. Oh, yeah, easily. Yeah. So uh, to me, I think... I don't really think that him looking like crap has changed much because nobody else has come out and and torn it up. When other guys have been on the field, they've all just been meh too. Well, CJ so, Anderson has looked better, but in then in better. super limited carries. Though. Right, and, and I mean, when you say better, it's not like he's like, oh man, it's like a lightning no, rod on the offense hard, when he's out much, there. It's not that hard to look that much better than Monty Ball the way he's looking right now. Is the thing. Right. So, but the point that I'm trying to make, though, is I don't think that his job is in in jeopardy. No, at this Denver's point. clearly still using him. I, I, and and if he does lose his job throughout the year, I think it'll be to an outside trade. Yeah, I really don't see C.J. Anderson taking his job. I don't. Ronnie Hillman sure as fuck ain't. It would yeah. have to be a move like, oh man, Denver requires C.J. Spiller, and then it's yep. like, oh shit. Like, yeah. Uh, then C.J. Spiller instantly becomes a guy that you have to target. And Monty Ball's just on the dump him list. Right. Exactly. And and, and so. unless a situation like that happens, not. I think as the question as it pertains to the question, I still think that right now I'm buying Monty Ball. I'm yep, not me selling too. him off because he's still gonna have games. He still gets another game. He gets two games versus Oakland still coming up. He gets another game versus Kansas City. He he plays. He, the schedule is much harder than it was last year, but he still has some really good money matchups this year yep. for him. And he's just gonna you expect him to have like damn, we can have a three TD game that week easy. He's gonna and, have and those. actually I I think this is the perfect time to buy him because yeah. he's coming off values of- low. Yeah. He's coming off of what will probably be his worst game of the year Without against Seattle. Yeah. And it's the toughest matchup of the year too. So you're getting Without him, a doubt. Yeah. you're getting him at a point where he's probably going to do better from here on out. So I like that. Uh, I think people are down on him after the first three games, especially if they watch the games, if they're only looking at the numbers, if they're just a, a, a casual fantasy person, there's actually a possibility that they might be somebody who values him higher, yep. oddly enough. Um, but if you're if you're somebody if you're trading with somebody who has Monty Ball on their roster and they've watched, watched a lot of the Denver games, they've seen how bad he looks. They've seen him just run into his own guys and dance around the backfield and lose yards constantly and just be a complete <laughs> piece of shit. Then yeah, you probably the value's probably been pretty low with that person because holy right. god, he's looked bad. Right. So I think it's one of those rare circumstances where you can actually possibly uh, go after the person who might be more knowledgeable as oh, God, as crazy man. as that sounds so i like monty ball going forward i still believe in him as being a, a probably think, a top 10 running back this. think about all the running backs that win that same class as him in the same round giovanni bernard Le'Veon bell monty ball and eddie lacy which one of these is not like the other <laughs> and that's who denver you imagine if giovanni bernard was in the denver offense where he'd go you imagine his uh, upside this year? Dude, top five pick. God. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, Giovanni Bernard's in that in that uh, in that roster. I'm oh, definitely so taking him right too. behind Matt Forte. Yeah, he's so built for that offense. Yeah. Yep. 
It's crazy. It's, it's crazy. How, I mean, Denver how much is made different. Denver would have been rather than Gio Bernard. With that, they gotten Giovanni Bernard. It, it's funny because Denver has made such great decisions on certain things, and then just such oh shit yeah, decisions killer options on others. Amazing. So. Talib, Ware, Ward, all those guys coming in. You know, bringing Emmanuel Sanders, letting Decker go. Emmanuel Sanders cheaper looks amazing. But yeah. man, it looks bad letting No Sean go to give Monty Ball the reins because shit, he looks bad. <laughs> it's true, man. But we still like him as far as fantasy purposes. We yeah, we're fantasy, buying low on him, it, but for for the team's success, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, as a Denver fan, Dustin's a little bit biased. Yeah, but... it's 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 rough right now in the running back situation. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the final question that somebody asked us on on YouTube, and that was coming from Colton Fruling, and he wants us to pick three players. And again, unfortunately, didn't tell if it's tell us if it's PPR. Or Gotta not. Gotta do or, it. Have to do it. If you ask the question, you have to be specific. I know, and I it didn't want everything. I, some of these questions I didn't even want to put on here because it's so tough. But this one, I think we can we can still kind of decipher it just right. based on the positions that most of these guys are. So I'm assuming this is two wide receivers and a flex here, but we need Standard. to pick three of yeah. them. Okay, so we've got Antonio Brown, Keenan Allen, Lamar Miller, Jeremy Macklin, and Brandon Marshall this week. Holy shit! Yeah, I think this is uh, you're in a really good situation. Yeah. This has got to be like an eight. Really, in a bad answer there. Yeah, this has got to be a, a pretty low low level league because uh, <laughs> you shouldn't you shouldn't have rostered you shouldn't be able to roster Brandon Marshall, Antonio Brown, and Keenan Allen in the same league. Coming That's feasible. I mean, Keenan Allen's going a little bit lower than he and he should have. I mean, in, well, like fifth round PPR, maybe. I yeah, mean, you would have to have PPR, taken Marshall's not going as high. Neither is I mean, Antonio Brown especially is going as high as not PPR. True, true. I guess that's true. But it's feasible on a ten team. I mean, if you drafted <sighs> really well, you're drafting a bunch of assholes. But it's feasible. Maybe it is. Maybe I'm maybe I'm thinking just a little bit too highly of these guys, but. Uh, at the end of the day, I think that you're going into this every single week. You're starting Antonio Brown, yeah. and I, my opinion is you start Brandon Marshall every single week too, yeah. so long as he's healthy. Yep, I pretty much uh, agree and, with that. And that's the thing is Brandon Marshall's not healthy right now, but Good matchup. we've seen him fuck tear it Green up. Bay. Yeah, fuck Green Bay. They look terrible. So Yeah, and Green Bay has looked really bad with the exception of against Detroit. Which yeah. that just is so and, and weird to me, but just asshole too. So right. So uh, I think we're going. I, I'm going Antonio Brown, Brandon Marshall, and then my third guy. I'm actually going to go with Jeremy Macklin. He's yep. gotten a touchdown in every game thus far. Uh, looked very, very good. He, I mean, he missed the entire season. Yeah, he's last firmly year. the number one receiver there in Philadelphia, and I love that offense for fantasy. So yeah, I, I have the exact same great one. situation. I mean, I mean, the thing is, is I mean, Keenan Allen is still. I still, I'm. I was super high on Keenan Allen going in the year. I'm still really high on Keenan Allen because he has so much talent. Yeah. He's, the production is going to come, and he has a great matchup this week in Jacksonville. But it it just seems silly to bank on him getting his season started this week when you have those other options. Yeah, much safer options to go with this week. Okay. Lamar Miller, I really like his matchup too. He plays Oakland, and Oakland has just been fucking god awful on the ground. And it's just got and it's on a neutral field general. too. I right. think that that's actually a pretty important thing because the, it's, in the, London. it's going to say on your sheet, it's going to say at Oakland. But it's not really. In, yeah. But it's not in Oakland. It's not a home game for Oakland. They're it's playing kinda, at, at kinda Wembley. They got, they got screwed on that. but Well, when you – yeah, well. It's not like it matters when you're Oakland. Fuck it. But still, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is kind of messed up. You have a home game in London for one of those for this year. but Right. There isn't a bad matchup there, but I completely agree with you. I got Jimmy Macklin who's completely torn up. Brandon Marshall and Tony Brown are every week starters. You can't bench them. So we have the same yep. ones. Yep. So we're going to go with those three receivers this week. Um you know, it could be different going forward based on what we see, but yeah, I think those are the three guys for this week. So let's move on to the final segment. We do this every single week, and what we're going to be talking about are our busts and our sleepers for the week. So yep. for busts, we're looking at guys who are normally players that are in your lineup every week. So typically guys who are in like the top 24 or so at their position. So they either qualify as an RB2 at least or a wide receiver too, if we're going running backs or wide receivers, or if they're a tight end or a quarterback, they're in the top 12 roughly. Right. So that kind of qualifies them as potentially being a bust. And what we're basically saying here is that these guys are guys who, while they normally are starters, we don't like them this week for some reason. So I'm going to get things started right off the bat here with my bust of the week, and that All is right. Cordero Patterson as he goes up against the Atlanta Falcons. Hmm. Now, Cordero Patterson is a player who I think a lot of people were looking at coming into this year as being a potential breakout huge candidate. breakout guy, yeah. but he hasn't caught more than four passes in any game yet this season. He had that monster week one with the run, and I think that kind of overshadowed what the reality of the situation is. But Cordero Patterson is not a he's not a shining star receiver at this point in his career. He's just not. And he was only targeted three times 
once Teddy Bridgewater took over for Matt Castle, he was fourth among wide receivers in terms of targets, targets for the Vikings. So I think that that's something we definitely have to look at. Now, that's a very small sample size, and we can't look too deep into it. Yeah, but it, it is say. It is important to look at, though. It, it's important to consider the fact that Cordero Patterson is not a guy who's going to be out there on 100% of the snaps. He's sure. not going to get He's not going to get targeted 15 times in a game. It's just not going to happen. He might at some point, but yeah, not, not Right now, anything. he's not. It, it, that's the thing. And but, the other thing, too, is that the Falcons have allowed the fewest receptions per game to opposing wide receivers this season. So while their defense is not great, it has done an okay job of at Des- least slowing Trufon. down wide receivers. Yeah, they have Desmond Trufant as a stud. He can just straight up eliminate a wide receiver. So, I mean, yeah, if he draws Des Trufant this week, it might be a really, really bad week for him. Yeah, and but- I mean, if you're banking on him getting a carry out of the backfield and breaking it for an 80-yard touchdown, God bless you, but I'm just not going to do that. The one thing I'll say about Cordero Patterson is North Turner's a defensive coordinator. North Turner's a hell of an offensive coordinator. He's super under- super underrated for that. And I, it's just Cordero Patterson has such incredible talent. Like, that dude with the ball in his hand just straight glides. I was so high on him coming out of the draft, so I'm probably a little biased just because of that. But I have to think at some point with him, they're going to figure out, like, just get the ball in his hands. Like, mm-hmm. you need to just make sure that he gets a certain amount of touches per game, no matter how they come. Run you some know. screens. Do whatever you need to do. Just get the ball in that guy's hand. It's not that difficult. I, I mean, agree. Your other wide receiver is Greg Jennings. Fuck him. You know, they, they, I, they lost Kyle Rudolph. You lost Adrian Peterson. Get the ball in your best offensive player's hands. I, th- I think so, too. Out. I just, we haven't seen it yet at this point, oh, yeah, so you I'm can't not buying it. it. Yeah, but I think it will, I mean, you hope it will eventually happen for his sake. Right. So, Dustin, tell me who is your bust of the week this week? Yeah, uh, you know, it, it's, this week I, I'm looking at Reggie Bush. You know, he, he faces the no! Jets. No! Yeah, not yeah. Reggie! Yeah, not not against the Jets. You know I, know I love Reggie. Jets. You I can't know. say not, you can't say bad things about Reggie well, Bush. You know, I know, but here we are. Not on this podcast, here mister. <laughs> I, I don't like I don't like any running backs matchup with the Jets really at all because they just shut down the run. They have so many just monsters inside. And beyond that, though, Detroit's offense has just looked bad the past couple weeks. And I don't think they're yep. going to stay bad because, again, there's so much talent on that offense. But this week, I'm if I have other options, there's no way I'm playing Reggie Bush versus this defense. Because I also think if there's a goal line carry to go around this game, it's going to Joyke. So I, I definitely think Reggie Bush, if I have other options, I'm definitely sitting him this week. And if I play him, I'm not expecting very much at all, no matter what the format is for Reggie Bush. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's it's so tough when you bench a guy like a Reggie Bush. By the way, Reggie Bush is really the only guy that did anything from a fantasy standpoint for them last week. And it was really only because he broke one play for a touchdown. So, yep. I mean, it's tough because... I still think Reggie Bush has the more talent of the two players between he and Joyke. Oh, but, sure. But I mean, it's just... Might, but it's situation, it's the Jets. Right. And no matter what talent it is, nobody runs on the Jets. Right, exactly. And I think you made up. A, you brought up a good point, which is at the goal line, the guy who's more likely yeah, to get the touch is Joyke Bell. Yeah. And that's kind of what you're banking on against the Jets. Not that they're like known for giving up goal line touchdowns or anything, but that you're not going to have Reggie Bush and Joyke Bell rushing for 150 yards each this week no, or 150 no total yards. Yeah, no chance. So, uh, you know, you kind of need to bank on one of them scoring. And if you're banking on one of them scoring, it's probably going to be Joyke Bell. Yeah, so, exactly. I pretty much agree with that. So let me know then, what is your sleeper of the week? If we're if we're sitting Reggie Bush, who are we going to play potentially in his place? I'm gonna, t- I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you a little trivia here. Who do you All think right. right now, if San Diego looking as good as they look? Who do you think leads that team in targets? <laughs> who do you think is Philip Rivers' most well, targeted guy right now? Let's see here. I think, I mean, based on the fact that he is has done so well, I know he had a really shit week last week with, like, right. one catch for eight yards, but I'm going to guess Antonio Gates. Oh, man. And, and you know, it you'd never guess him. I mean, that team, you would think, you know, like, oh, man, he has the chemistry with Malcolm Floyd. They have Keenan Malcolm Allen, Floyd? Antonio no. Gates. It's Eddie Royal. Eddie <laughs> Royal leads that team in targets, and it, they're really designing plays for Eddie Royal. Eddie like, Royal. I know. I know it's Eddie Royal, and he hasn't been relevant in, like, seven years. But it, for the first time, they're really getting him involved. And he has the best matchup you could ever hope for this week. He has Jacksonville. He's still yeah. unknown in the vast majority of leagues. And if I need to play someone this week because of injury or whatever the case may have, I'm definitely picking up Eddie Royal. I love his matchup. I love the targets. They're using specifically designed plays for him. Him and Phillip Rivers have really good chemistry right now. Keenan Allen's not seeing a lot of targets. I really, really like Eddie Royal this week. Well, you know, I'm on board with that this week. <laughs> and the reason it, for it is because... Uh. Yeah, I mean, he's up against Jacksonville. I'm I'm actually in the situation. I've 
gone through some injuries in a league, and it's a 14-team league, and I had Adrian Peterson, so don't oh, crucify me. But I'm starting Eddie Royal in the league this week, yeah, and I, I, I kind of feel too. okay about it. I kind of no, feel okay I, I feel about fine, it. I fine, man. There's so many worse options you could have on just a week-to-week. I mean, straight up for this week, if you have a flex, I'm playing Eddie Royal over Reggie Bush. I really yeah. am. I could I could see it. Yeah. Uh, I think that the the high end potential for the catches is there for him. Um, TD and potential he's, there. He's getting targeted in the red zone, which is so weird because yeah. he's not a big bodied receiver. They're gonna have bubble but... screens. They, well, the one thing that they have is they have big guys who can block. Keenan Allen is a really good blocking wide receiver. Right. And they still have they have Larry Screen. They roll out there who's an okay blocker, and they also have uh, Malcolm Floyd, who's a big guy too. Yep. So they squeeze him in there, and they just give him some blockers to go behind on screens, and he goes. Yep. Interesting. Uh, I, I mean, I agree. So my guy for this week is a guy who tore it up last week, and I expect it to be kind of a similar situation. That's Garrett Blunt, and he's going up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this week. Yep. Now, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have given up over 300 yards rushing in three games this year, Terrible. and that came against the Panthers, the Rams, and the Falcons. Not exactly the best running backs. So I think... Le'Veon Bell obviously is Stud. we're not we're not talking about Le'Veon Bell not having a big game here. I think Le'Veon Bell is my RB one, like my number one running back this week going yeah, up against Tampa Bay. Yep. So um I, I wouldn't be surprised if he came out there and just had a friggin' monster game, 150 yards, a touchdown or two. Um I wouldn't be surprised at all if that happens. But I think that the Steelers are gonna get up a decent amount in this game, and I think in the fourth quarter you're gonna see a lot of Garrett, LeGarrette Blunt. Or and just I also a goal wouldn't line be TD too. Right. And that's the other thing I was going to bring up. I mean, this is the kind of guy who, while he hasn't been that successful statistically at the goal line, he gets a ton of opportunities. Yep, exactly. So, so I like that a lot. I think that LeGarrette Blunt has a decent potential this week for uh, to sneak in there for a touchdown and get you maybe 50, 70 yards on the ground. And uh, with that being said, I think that that is – it's good enough to – Put him in there if you're in a tough situation. You need a flex player for the week. Uh, yeah, there's a absolutely. ton of teams on buys this week. ton of big offenses on buys. Yeah, no so, Money Ball, no Marshawn, no Ellington this week. Right. Yeah, all those guys. And, yeah, I could def- I like LeGarrette Blunt this week. I do because, I mean, Tampa doesn't get any. I mean, it, Jacksonville is maybe worse for a matchup or for, good for a matchup, I guess, for an opposing yeah. team. But Tampa Other Bay's than that, Tampa Bay has been absolutely brutal. Um, their numbers look almost inflated based on the fact that their pass defense has been so atrocious, yeah. but I think that their run defense is bound to give up more touchdowns. And I think that this week is a very good possibility. They give up at least two on the ground to, to Pittsburgh. So yeah, I like LeGarrette Blunt. Bells look too. They're going to be running the ball all day. Exactly. So that is pretty much going to do it today for our episode. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We hope that you enjoyed it. We hope that you learned something. If you did, make sure you press that like button below and also be sure to press the subscribe button so that you can be updated when we put out our next episode. Now, if you guys have any questions about your lineup for next week's games, if you're thinking about making a trade or if you just have a general fantasy football question, make sure that you leave that in the comment section below or send a tweet to either at Project KSL or at Clickwood TV. And also make sure you give Dustin Project KSL a follow mm-hmm. on that Twitter. We will do our best to answer those questions for you guys. It could be a situation where we need to answer it on Twitter or on YouTube just because we'll if you're asking a question. Yeah. yeah, but if you're asking a question about this weekend's games, obviously we're not going to be putting out another podcast before Sunday or Monday. So uh, definitely, like I said, be sure to uh, send us those tweets so that we can get back to you on Twitter. So, thank you guys again. We do appreciate it. Good luck in week four, and we will talk to you guys next time on the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.